Really, thanks for coming. It's really you know great to see you all here. Um, today, obviously, we're talking about um, spotting digital inclusion. So you know, spotting it, and and we're going to have a chat also about how do we tackle it. Um, uh, some of you will obviously be involved more directly than others in in this, but it's a chance for us all to think about um, you know what does it look like? Are we you know are we overlooking it sometimes? Uh, why it's important to spot it as well. Uh, and we'll have a chat. So we've been joined today by uh, Corona from, uh, I'm gonna get this the wrong way around, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we've got Corona from uh, Care Network. We've got uh, Trish from uh, How Are You? And we've got Kelly Austin, who is social prescriber for the Grant uh, Medical Practices. I've got that right, haven't I guys? Yep, hopefully. Um, and, um, so we're going to we're going to have a I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the issues today, and then we're going to have a, a chat with the panel and, and have some questions, and then a chance for for all of you to ask your questions too. So um, I hope that's what you're looking forward to, and um, we'll get started. Uh, just to start off by talking a little bit about Cambridge Online, who I work for. If the slides will actually there we go, uh, will work. Uh, so I work for Cambridge Online. I just took over. Uh, in September, uh, but I've been doing digital inclusion since uh, 2007, so about 14 years. Uh, Cambridge Online has been working in digital inclusion uh, since 1995. It put its first computer in Cambridge Library in 1996, so probably one of the very longest running uh, organisations to tackle digital inclusion in the country. Um, that old, that the term wasn't even invented then. Uh, we do skills and training and over lockdown we helped about 500 families or households with devices and data. Uh, and another 200 with advice. Uh, we've been nominated for an award. Please, quick plug, if you could vote for us, that would really help. Uh, and we are a founding member of the Cambridgeshire Digital Partnership, who are us, uh, CHS, the Local Housing Association, uh, Cambridge Youth Panel, Cambridge Council for Voluntary Services, uh, and Cambridgeshire Libraries, that's the kind of the core group at the moment uh, and we're always looking for new organisations and talking to new organisations about joining us. Uh, Sally, I think, are you going to, to say a little bit more about that at the end? Yep, yeah, I can do, as long as there's a few minutes, definitely. Brilliant, well I'll try and make sure there's some time to, to talk about that. <clears throat> um, so that's us. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about digital inclusion. So here is a completely fictitious, but nonetheless true graph about digital inclusion um, for those of you that are more visually minded. Um, and in simple terms, you can, you can see that digital inclusion is, like, is less likely the more people's health needs or their social exclusion or poverty go up. I don't think that's going to be too controversial uh, a thing to say, and hopefully you know, many of you are already aware of, of that relationship. So that's, you know, as I say, completely fictitious graph that I just knocked up to kind of illustrate what we're talking about and why we're talking about it. Um, but let's back that up with a few facts. The slides will actually play ball. There you go. So, um, yeah, so in uh, the last few years, around a third of people have used digital tools for health and well-being and over lockdown it was basically half um, but for, for a lot of people it's actually that much harder to access that so as you can see there around about half of people with an impairment lack you know foundational essential basic skills uh, and then 85 percent of people that do use the internet you know report being connected uh, so, you know, and I think we probably all of us that are connected know how much we've used it to, to stay in touch with people, especially in the last couple of years. Um, around two thirds of people that, that are online say it helps them financially. And again, I should imagine a lot of us would know um, from personal experience how it can help. But as you can see there, uh, a really key fact, I think, that's, that's worth taking in, into account and, you know, going back to that graph around uh, you're around 10 times more likely to not be online if you're in the poorest quarter of households uh, and twice as likely as an average household. So, you know, there's a really strong relationship between uh, struggling financially and being offline, which, you know, compounds the, the statistic before those people that least need help financially are most able to access it. 
Um, this is uh, the next fact is something that that I um, I, I pull together really from from a series of facts. As I say, it's not actually a statistic in its own right, but if you look at the statistics that are out there uh, around population and around uh, uh, poverty, um, then we can say, you know, with a reasonable degree of confidence, I think that there's around 13,000 people in Cambridge City on its own that are either digitally excluded or are very high risk of being digitally excluded. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about what we mean by that in a minute and, and perhaps some of the myths around that. Um, why we might want to be thinking about this, the NHS say that there's a return on investment of over six times for every pound that is uh, invested in getting somebody online and digitally included, they will see a return of, of six times that money into the NHS. And in fact, the total uh, return on investment that's been calculated is, is more like 15 times for those who are excluded, who get basic digital skills. So actually the social value of tackling this is really actually very high and, and well worth considering. Um, to talk about how I made the, um, how I came up with that fact around 13,000, there's around uh, 136,000 people in uh, the city and uh, fuel poverty statistics from the Vital Science Report this year um, say that at least 11% of people are suffering from fuel poverty, which I think is a, is a good indicator of people who might be struggling financially more widely. Um, and I think, you know, we can say that's a minimum because there will be people that won't fit into those statistics that, that um, or haven't been fitting into those statistics, who now will be with the fuel price rises and the uh, universal credit cut and all the other stuff that's going on at the moment that's putting a lot more financial pressure on people. So, you know, 13,000, I think, is actually a conservative estimate. And we can say that it's actually, you know, quite a lot higher without really uh, feeling like we might be uh, overstating the case. And the slides just will not go today. So why do we care about this? So the NHS, and you know, there are many other lenses through which to look at this, um, but the NHS are clear that digital inclusion is really important. Uh, and their own uh, digital arm uh, have put together a series of uh, resources uh, and, uh, and actually a report on the case for digital inclusion. Um, sorry, my Zoom is playing up a bit at the moment. So uh, I'm having a bit of trouble moving stuff around so I can actually see the slides as I'm talking to you. Um, but as you can see there, they actually have um, identified a number of reasons why digital inclusion is important for them to tackle. Uh, it's not the only set of reasons, uh, of course, at all. And there are plenty of reasons outside the NHS around, uh, you know, social justice, uh, increased access to services, uh, empowerment uh, and so forth that we could actually talk about but you know as today we're sort of talking about it from a kind of health lens I thought this was a, you know perhaps a, a good way of, of summing up some of the reasons why uh, we, we want to be thinking about these issues uh, and of course as well uh, I suppose the other thing to say before we move on really is that it's become even more important during lockdown um, uh, and you know I think most of us have seen that uh, if not all of us have seen that being connected is really, really important. Uh, and of course, for those that aren't online, then that gap between, you know, them and us, if you want to call it that, has only got bigger. And, and that's really important and something we shouldn't lose sight of. So what does digital exclusion look like? In simple terms, you can think of it as being a lack of these three things. Devices i.e. a computer, a phone, a tablet, connectivity, so broadband, and skills. And I suppose a subset of skills is confidence. Um, perhaps we could, we could add that in there too. So uh, when we work with people, and those of us that work with people that are digitally excluded, we will see you know, issues with one or all of these areas uh, that are actually preventing people accessing services. Uh, and I think the other thing that I would really like to stress at this point is people um, often talk about inclusion or exclusion, uh, and it's not a binary situation. It may be that it was once upon a time, I think when I first started, uh, which was kind of the time that smartphones first came around, uh, literally like the first iPhone, then you know people had a computer and an internet connection or they didn't. So it was quite straightforward uh, in lots of ways. Whereas now it's much more of a, 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 a kind of 
uh, two extremes, but then there's a whole gray area in the middle where you have people that maybe have a device, they have some skills and they maybe have limited connectivity uh, and maybe their device also limits in what they can do. So they're not completely digitally excluded, but um, what they can actually offer and what they can actually do uh, is perhaps really quite severely hampered. Uh, as well as their ability to afford to continue to do it. So I think that's really important that we, we, we uh, are explicit about that as an issue that we need to keep uh, in mind and, and look at how we can tackle. Um, and I suppose the other issue is we're talking about people who are not yet online or only partially online. There's also an issue about keeping people online. Again, with the, the rise in uh, financial pressure, um, uh, during lockdown, we saw quite a few people who came to uh, Cambridge Online for help, not because they didn't have a device and needed one, but because they had a device and it had gone, uh, you know, it had died and they didn't have uh, the resources to repair it or to replace it. So it's going to be an issue going forward because people will continue to have devices that, you know, unfortunately break or become unusable for one reason or another. And sorry, the slides are still being very slow. So how do we spot digital um, exclusion? Uh, I like to think of it as the uh, stick of rock syndrome. So, you know, that kind of uh, the letters going through a stick of Brian rock. Uh, digital exclusion is something really that um, has a two way relationship with so many aspects of our life these, lives these days. And as I say, lockdown has only increased that really as more and more services have gone online. Uh, and, you know, in many cases are now online only or certainly very much preferred to be uh, online. So some of the areas where you might uh, spot that you've got somebody who's digitally excluded. And again, if you look at the statistics, you know, that will actually really help you to see how these issues are interrelated. But, you know, if you're seeing people that are struggling with bills and I talked about fuel poverty earlier, but, you know, actually quite a few people struggle with their connectivity bills and other things as well. Uh, water bills uh, and so on and debt, uh, credit history, then that means you can, you, can, you can expect them to be at increased risk of being digitally excluded. Uh, if they're isolated, uh, there's, uh, you know, we see that that's uh, an issue very often. Um, people who are carers and are again on low incomes usually uh, or very often. Uh, people with health problems, people with uh, disability, long-term uh, patients, and, and repeat patients. Again, these are several areas where if you've got the same people coming, you know, if you're a clinic or a support service and you've got the same people coming back to you time and time again, it's a good, you know, it's a good bet that digital exclusion is part of the pattern and part of the, the issues that they're facing uh, and potentially part of the solution to some of those issues. Um, as well as that, I would say, um, you know, think about the geography. Again, I think somebody's just put in the chat about Wisbeach. Um, we know there are areas of deprivation uh, in Cambridge and across Cambridgeshire. Um, you know, there are heat maps uh, that you can actually access around those areas of deprivation. So, you know, if you're working in certain geographical areas or if your uh, client group uh, is scattered across an area that includes an area of deprivation, then again, just be mindful that, that those people in those areas are more likely to, to need digital exclusion tackling in their situation. Um, and I suppose the other one that potentially gets overlooked quite a lot, um, and we're seeing a bit more focus on it recently, but, um, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't miss out the, the just about managing, you know, the jams as sometimes they're called. Um, often we're talking about low skilled people, people who are maybe working. Uh, you'll probably have seen some of the statistics on the rise in working poverty. Again, that's a group of people that you can, you can, think that it's probably worth asking about, you know, are they connected? Can they afford to stay connected? Are they struggling with that? Do they have enough data? Do they have the device? Do they have the skills or confidence that they need? Um, so that is kind of a whistle-stop tour of diagnosing digital exclusion. Um, and uh, we're just going to uh, open up things to the panel. Hello, Corona. Hi. Hi. Hi, yes. I can't see um, what everybody else can see at the moment because my Zoom is completely frozen. 
<laughs> oh goodness no no you're, you're fine we can still see the the diagnosing digital exclusion page so yeah i think you're i think you're fine um yes just to, to highlight some of the yeah really to emphasize some of the things that you you've already pointed out there i mean now it is um it's it's more important than ever isn't it to be able to, for people to be able to access accurate and up-to-date information and support online when they need it um, and with so many more services and information now going, uh, you know, having been relocated online, it really kind of denies access to and um, the digitally excluded who are often the people who need that, that support most. Um, and I suppose I just, yeah, as the last slide showed, there's many reasons why people might not have digital access um, or might not want to have digital access as well, because that's, an, that's, that's another point. Um, and I think, you know, obviously at Care Network, we do work with a lot of older clients, um, but it's not just older clients. As you said, there's a lack of, afford of affordability when people may be choosing, you know, whether to stay fed and, you know, stay fed or warm, you know, and it's, there's, there's, there's all of this, this going on. Um, there's physical or mental ill health. Sometimes things can just seem very overwhelming online. I think even for us as professionals, sometimes when you go online and you're having to fill in forms and it can just be information overload. So I think that's, um, that is something that, that people, um, even if they have access, might need ongoing support with. Um, and, you know, lots of people that do come to us, they may be at Christ crisis point before they're seeking that help. And, um, and all of these systems can become so overwhelming to them. So I think there is a role for us as professionals really to to try to keep things as simple as possible to collaborate where we can behind the scenes to help people to to navigate the system know where the support is um and yeah help them to access it really yeah James sorry could I just ask you to unshare your screen and we can see the speakers a little yeah bit sure better. thank you there we go oh that's better it's it's clearly the sharing that was giving giving me a problem there so hi hi Corinna and Kelly no, hi. Uh, I don't I don't mind that it didn't show me at all well, that's, that's you before you moved straight in there <laughs> um to do is it just helpful if you uh, all three of you just kind of give a, a quick um introduction of yourselves to, to everybody um Corinna do you want to, to start sorry yes I'm um, I introduced myself in the chat but um yeah so I'm Corinna O'Flaherty said and, and I co-manage the community navigator service at Care Network Trish Thanks, James. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm Trish. I am the lead for the How Are You project, which is part of the broader community mental health transformation piece. So we're the digital project within that. Great. And last but by no means least, Kelly. Hello, everyone. Yes, uh, Kelly Austin. I'm a wellbeing team lead and social prescriber for Grant Medical Practices PCN in uh, South Cambridge. And an additional role, I'm also East of England champion for the National Association of Link Workers. So, uh, yeah, I hear a lot of a buzz on the ground about digital inclusion and, and how it is across the region. So, uh, really good to be in the conversation today. Yeah, thanks all for coming. So, I've got some questions to, to set to you and get your brains working. Um, first one, what do you think are the, 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 the issues with digital exclusion for, for the people that you work with? What, what do you think um, are the difficulties for them and, and what they're facing? Um, who would like to start? Trish? Thanks, James. So what we're trying to do with How Are You, so we're not a digital service, we're a resource really. We're trying to bring together all that local knowledge about things that have got wellbeing benefit and park them in a digital space. So we've been really mindful from the beginning about who will and won't have access directly to that information. Um, our original brief, and we were a pre-COVID project, um, but actually it's perhaps become more timely now than, we, than when we first started. What we wanted to do was use, in a way, use digital inclusion as a bit of a stepping stone to social inclusion. So we were trying to get people from a screen connected out face to face, and we're still working to do that. Um, so rather than just give people information on a web page, we were using that as a way of doing introductions. So we've got a website that's full of friendly, smiley videos of people introducing themselves and activities locally um, to try and break down some of those barriers that people might face of getting out physically in the community to take part in things that we know are good for them. But it's really hard to take those first steps. So we've always approached that from a mindset of those people that do have that digital access. We're trying to take them and help them gain that more social face-to-face -face connection. But we work really carefully, not just to do a digital piece and not just compile something on a space, but to work 
in a really human way underneath that and connect people with that knowledge. So we don't just have a public facing website. We work really directly with all the professionals who are supporting people. So we make sure that that knowledge is available in two kind of ways, if you like, that direct digital access, but then through making sure our professional colleagues who are on the ground doing face to face support know where to find some of that resource. So we work really closely with them instead of just asking them to go and access in person. So I suppose for us, digital inclusion means people can get to that information directly without needing any support. Um, but we're really mindful to make sure that there's a cascade, there's a ripple effect of how people might find that knowledge, even if they're not directly accessing a digital resource. Great. So, so there's something around, um, again, as I was saying, really about empowering people to, to self-service. And uh, I think some of the some of the, the facts that some of the research has done recently is about how actually people can access the health support, you know, that way and actually save the NHS some time uh, and money. By, by supporting them to access those things that way. Thanks. And uh, Kelly, what about for you and social prescribing? Yeah, so it's been a bit of a strange one with social prescribing um, with the digital inclusion. Obviously, at Granta, we're in a little bit of a unique position. So we have a, a generally older population, um, but they're seen as quite an affluent population. So although we have pockets of deprivation and younger patients, obviously, as a whole, the problem we find is that we have lots of our patients who have the technology, family members might have bought it for them, but you know, they you, you visit them at home and you say, well, I see you've got an iPad. Oh, I don't open it though. I never use it. Oh no, it's, you yeah, know, yeah. it's the devil in tablet form. Um, so that's kind of, you know, our biggest hurdle is, is getting those people um, to not view it that way and to kind of see it as a bit of a, a friendly tool um, not something really scary. So that's one of the biggest hurdles we see, yes. So it's it's really about that fact, really, isn't it? That all three barriers, you, you can't just tackle a barrier, you've got to tackle whatever barrier, and sometimes it's all three, but sometimes it might be one, but actually it doesn't matter whether it's one barrier or three. If they can't get on, they can't get on. Yeah, absolutely. But in the surgery generally, um, obviously we've, with the pandemic, had to move to a lot more of a digital platform for for primary care services than we have before um, and everybody was very nervous about that and it almost got switched on overnight um, and now it's kind of one of the main ways we deliver services um, so it's kind of been a bit of a catch-22 with us you know the pandemic wasn't great but actually it's opened up a lot more healthcare that we can del deliver to patients in a completely different way and it's taken that stigma away from it quite often. Sort of forced, forced people's hands a bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Corona? Yes, hi, yes. Um, yeah, just that, that fear of the fear of the technology is a big thing, particularly with, with, with older people, and not just older people, but um, the fear about fraud and the scams, everything you see in the media, feeding that, feeding that fear, and, or just the mistake, uh, you know, being worried about making a mistake, and just that lack of trust in, um, can be a real hurdle for people. But I think, as you say, you know, when, when we're working with people, we're working with them as an individual. So there's no, it's, you know, it's, we, we, we can talk about older people, people with mental health concerns, people in different, but it's, it is, people are individuals. And I think that is, that is so important that everybody will need a, a kind of a tailored approach. Yeah, I, I suppose, it, I suppose the other thing is that the two of you highlighted that I did miss off my slide is the correlation between age and digital exclusion uh, as well. And that, that is, you know, actually, the biggest one in lots of ways um so thank you for kind of pointing that out because <laughs> I, I i didn't mention that one but it, it, that, it is it but is it a is kind of elephant in the room and in, in fact but I think also we have to be mindful that we can't disclude people because of their age. We have lots of patients we interact with in their 90s via email because they have other communications issues and that's their preferred method. And I don't think we should discount that because of their age as well. There's, there's It's a double edged sword. Yeah, uh, and I th uh, yeah, I suppose linking that as well is also that 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 um, we we talked a little bit about it not being binary. I think the other the other area that there's there's more focus coming on is kind of those limited users. So perhaps you've got some people where they yeah they can email you, um, but that's it, <laughs> or you know they can they can do something on Facebook, but that's it. Uh, and again, at all all age ranges, not just with older people, but you know there's a lot of people where you know th there can be a sort of uh, misunderstanding where oh, they've got Facebook, they must be okay. And of course, that doesn't mean they can apply for benefits or a job or, you know, speak to their, their friends and family if it's not through Facebook or, you know, uh, and so on. So um, 
it, it is a complex picture, as, as uh, Corinne said, you can't just kind of go, it, it, there's not a cookie cutter. Um, really, it's about seeing all those different aspects and how you, you help broaden somebody's access. Thank you. So our second question is, um, what do you think um, organisations can do to help their frontline workers to spot and tackle digital exclusion? It's a tough one. Who'd like to start? I'll, I'll jump in first. And um, for me, it's sort of training. You know, that slide you shared about what you're going to, what's going to give you a hint. It's almost, you know, applying that knowledge like you would if we went into a home and what were we going to spot for a safeguarding concern you know it's it's having those skills and that confidence to ask those questions and unpick those things and notice those things um you know it's all very easy for me to go out to a patient and notice they don't have an oven but it's harder to go out and notice that they don't have that connectivity or their range of connectivity as you said so i think it's it's a, a training and a confidence to ask the right questions Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. And, and asking people, you know, how do how do they want to, to receive information and support? Um, that's yeah, just um, recognizing that people will will want to access that in different ways. And it's and it is a real positive that we we have so much now to to offer people um, virtually. Thank you. And we certainly we certainly see that so we, we're a digital and community engagement team we put people and digital next to each other and absolutely i think empowering colleagues to say have the conversation talk to people about it um it's amazing how people start to share that information if you're willing to to put it out there on the floor and not feel that that's saying we feel like we failed because we're offering you something digital find out where those barriers are for individuals that, that you're in contact with and then you can take those challenges back and think how you address them I think sometimes we come across real nervousness of, of people who are worried about having this conversation. How do we do it without accepting that there is some digital offer, but it's instead of making that the compulsory way to interact, let's find out where it works and where it doesn't, and then think what solutions are for individual cases. Um, but I, I, absolutely for us, again, it's all about that confidence to start that conversation with people. Absolutely. And I think also the other thing is really we to see it more as being this thing that that is a strand through everything so you know for for, for lots of stuff now are they connected and if not how how is that impacting them so you know whether it be accessing medical support whether it be accessing health support whether it be accessing you know social activities um you know or, or you know accessing the services that, that you guys offer or the stuff that you're signposting people to because they've come to you it's it's i think there's a sense of can people access things as widely as as they as they could um and, and you know that it, that is that strand isn't it some people may only want to to be able to access things face to face but the question is do they have the option um to to access stuff differently and you know because you know most services now you can access things more widely if you're connected than if, if, if you're not. So I think that's an important thing to bear in mind when you're, when you're looking at services for people. Um, you know, can they access everything they need to access without being online? You know, and, and you know, that kind of wider social thing, you know, you're working with people and often the people you're working with, they've got other issues. They maybe need other support other than what we're delivering. It's thinking that more widely. And, and you know, I think it's always worth having that conversation really almost as a kind of, set part of the assessment with people are you you know are you connected are you able to, to to access stuff online when you need to if you need to and if not what can we do about it you know that might just be signposting or it might be you know actually you know accessing support people you know accessing support directly within your organization for that person but i think it's it's, it's worth thinking about in assessments more and more for people is that part of your assessment I think we also see the awkwardness of that conversation the other way around as well and remembering the people you're talking to might find it really hard to say actually digital is a challenge for me so sometimes you pick it up through the, all the other things maybe you see people not attending the appointment they said they could get to digitally you might see it through other behaviors because it is something people find difficult to say i need help with yeah. so i think again encouraging professional colleagues to keep an eye out for the subtle signs even if someone is saying to you that this is a way that works for them are they actually making it? Are those connections working for them? And if not, can you help unpick what is it that's the real struggle? 
Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. And I think also, you know, sometimes, you know, crude data can be a starter for that question. Oh, have you got an email address? No? Oh, okay. You know, that that there right there is an indicator, isn't it, that somebody might be is digitally excluded if they haven't got an email address, or yes, I have got an email address, but I don't want you to email me on it. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things can be, you know, good kind of uh, tips. Um, we've got one question on conscious time is is moving on and we need to open up to, to the floor, but Lastly, how do you think other organisations could could do their part? What do you think would be your advice to other organisations sort of today about how they think about um, improving digital inclusion for their service users? Um, I think it comes again to to talking to people about you know the, themselves as an individual. You know what it is that they would like to achieve and and. Um, and then how they might like to go about it. And then these things would naturally, you know, barriers naturally become apparent um, for them. But, um, you know, we as professionals, as I said at the, you know, at, at the beginning, I think that, that, you know, we can do a lot to help people to navigate through to the support, to the support that they need um, and collaborate behind the scenes to kind of keep things simple for people. Um, and there's also things around something around using kind of alternative technologies as well and devices because somebody might have a smartphone but there might be a real limit to what they can do on on that smartphone um particularly if they have a visual impairment or perhaps they're not as dexterous or something so it's actually would that person would would, would a laptop be more suitable for that for that person um you know we've seen some great work through the pandemic haven't we people donating old laptops um, for, for children and, and, and young people, but there's other people in society that could really, um, you know, use that and um, that technology and that and that support. Um, and then it's not just the devices, is it? It's the it's the being able to use. It's having it's building that confidence. Um, so you know, digital champions. I know in, in normal times that people in the library have always been fantastic at supporting our our, our clients with with things like this. Thank you. Kelly, what do, you, what, what do you think? Is there some other stuff that organisations perhaps can do inside the organisations themselves? I think it's really about sort of knowing what your your patients, or target audience, your your service users, however you're you're coming at this, um, identifying what they need and what works for them. As as Karina said, it's it's such an individual thing, and everybody's issue is slightly different, and it's just as we've said before having those conversations to find what works for that person you know we work for the with the personalized care model and it's that whole approach of what matters to you um, as opposed to the medical model of what's the matter with you but that can it be applied to any setting um, you know whether it is the digital tool inclusion or anything everyone's situation is going to be different and it's having those conversations to find out what works for each of them um, also, I see Diane's on the call, so she'll uh, be uh, no surprise at all when I say I think a lot of it is about ease of access and different systems as well. Um, you know, just within the health setting, you've got our systems and the NHS apps and then the, the hospital systems are all completely different and separate. And You might get somebody confident on one system and then say, actually, but now you need to learn that system to get to that information. And then you're at ground zero again. So it's it's trying to make that ease of access as, as easy as possible for the, the client. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Trish? I think there's also that real thing of being able to, to show people what a digital offer might add to them. So is there value that, they, that might be added they maybe don't know yet because it's a realm they haven't touched? So we need to really be proactive in showing people what the offer might, might, might mean to them as well as maybe what they think they're asking for. So if I think about something like like trying to get some first contact for mental health support there are lots of different online offers that people might not be aware of so there's things like quell which is a chat system so a lot of the time people think they can't do a video call because it's hard to find that privacy inside a home but people might not be aware there are some things you can do that are silent digital interactions that may be for someone who can't find time uh, find a space where you can pick a phone up even there's a different way of doing things. But we again, we have to be brave enough to be able to showcase some of that to the people we're working with and say, actually, this might suit you. It might not. And there's no pressure for that to be the way you, you use it. But we don't if we don't show people what digital might do, we can't give them those opportunities. It's easy to forget that they might not know where the offer yeah. could be. Yeah, I think absolutely. At its best, digital inclusion is about increasing choice, not forcing forcing one. Um, I mean, you know, obviously that, that can be at odds with services that are really trying to push people online. 
Um, but I think, yeah, absolutely at its best, what you're doing is giving people more choice about how they access what they need. Um, you know, whether that be consumer services, you know, retail or, you know, or support, it's, it's all about giving people the choice of, you know, it's a bit like, you know, if you don't have a computer, you've got to go down to Tesco's for your shop. If you do, then you can choose, you know, delivery or click and collect, you know, you've, it's, it's about broadening that choice, isn't it? That's mm -hmm. great. So, uh, Sally, are we ready to take some questions from the floor, do you think? Um, yep, yep, perfect on time. Um, for this bit, everyone might want to go to gallery view um, so that you can see each other. To do that, you click on the view button at the top and then gallery, and there will be able to see people's hands up. And I think we've got Rosie, keen as you like, up there. <laughs> Hi, Rosie. Hi, James. Um, it's not so much, well, it's a sort of half question and a half observation. I'm, I'm hoping the last couple of years have moved us along a bit. But when I was out and about taking digital services out and about to communities, dementia cafes, things like that, the, I think we had a lot of unconscious barriers because if the people who were running the sessions weren't digitally clued up, they couldn't see what the benefits would be for their client groups. Yeah. And it's about how we sort of convert and enthuse those people first, isn't it? So I went to a dementia cafe in St. Ives and I took my iPad and they said, oh, no, no, can you not talk about that today? Because um, can you not just do the um, the reading for, for, for good health? Can you do the book list? I said, I'd rather not, because it, it would bore the pants off me. I said, just trust me. And so I held the iPad up. I said, right, how many people have got one of these? And practically every hand went up and the facilitators were shocked. And we had a lovely session about e-magazines. You know, you could have any newspaper in the middle of the night. If you couldn't get out for your caring duties, you could still have a newspaper or a book or a magazine. And at the end of the session, the worker said, where can I get one of those? So I'm hoping, journalism, isn't there? Yeah, I'm hoping the last year or so has moved us on from that. But I would, I think we might still have pockets where people are genuinely still afraid. And they think that's probably, they haven't got time for that because they're pressurised. Just an observation. Yeah, and I think that also comes back to that kind of digital inclusion, not being, you know, binary, not being black and white. And there are degrees, you know, even within you know, the sort of uh, staff base of actual inclusion and engagement with digital. Um, and that is something that organisations, I think, need to be aware of because they will have some people probably, or, or lots of them may have some people that are actually acting as a barrier to digital inclusion for their workers if they're not actually understanding the benefits. And yes, you know, there can be risks. And I think that's important not to completely overlook. But I think, uh, you know, there, there's equally a, an issue and particularly in certain kind of organizations there can be an over focus on the risk um, without actually looking at the risk of not getting people digitally included and I think that's important that we that we when we talk about risk we're not talking about risk in one direction there is risk if you don't get your people online too so you know what do you do about that um, and I think that's something that you know some organizations have to have more and more internal conversations about uh, things have moved on in that 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 uh, front and I think you know we saw it in say the education sector there was big internal conversations around that um, years ago and that they've kind of moved on with that in terms of you know due diligence and mitigating risk and I think that's still to go out to some other sort of you know uh, organs um, to actually get digital inclusion out there and and some of the people that maybe even recognize that it would be helpful to really take it as seriously as it needs to be taken. Do we have any other questions? I can't see any. I haven't had any direct questions, I don't think, in the chat, but um, but some comments. I think it was um, Sarah from Possibility. Um, I don't know whether you'd like to share your comment in there about um, people that you've been working with. It's quite interesting. Let's unmute myself then. Um, yes, yeah, so... So our, we do um, exercise sessions for people with long-term health conditions, so stroke survivors, um, neurological conditions, all that sort of thing. Um, the majority of our clients are 75 to 84. Uh, when on the first lockdown, we did go online. We didn't know whether we could possibly could, but hooray, we did it. And, um, but only about a third of them joined in. Um, there's on the news today, there is a question around more lockdowns this winter. So we have the 
we have the technology to go back online again, but how can I encourage more people to join in? Because what we've really noticed is people's lack of mobility, their deterioration over the last 12 months, it's really marked. Um, people who were fairly able beforehand aren't now. So any ideas you've got would be fantastic. Um, can I jump in here, Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Hi, um, hi, I just Sarah. wondered if while you're able to do face-to-face -face sessions, is there an, an opportunity there to, to do a demo almost and uh, maybe get some digital champions in your in your group and to just to, to, to be that kind of to encourage people to show them that they that if they want if there's something they want to do that they that they can particularly with I, with, with support I think with some of the groups yes there is an opportunity for that with others um they do have really quite severe um health problems so so, you know, we'd have to kind of pick our groups a bit, really, I think. Um, but also it's OK. So where do they then get the tech from? How can they get the connectivity? You know, all that sort of thing. And, oh, I'm not sure that we want because I did get a little pot of money so I could I could lend them some um, some tech. No, we don't really want to do that because I'm worried about breaking it. So though yeah. that that's what's happening on the front line. Um, so mm. any ideas, I'm, I'm more than willing to have a go. Mm. Sarah, we could perhaps have a talk about that after today, but I've, there's possibly some funding that might allow you to do some work around that, um, that the CCF have got available that you could, that you could put in for. Um, and we that would be brilliant, James. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we have got a small pot of funding, but, um, you know, more is always better, isn't it? <laughs> I'd just jump in on that as well so it's something we found we've found has worked so prior to the pandemic we were doing um group consultations so we'd have sort of six to eight patients with the same um health concerns in a room together and have it as a, a sort of one-to-one -one within a group session if that makes sense and obviously with the pandemic we then moved that um to virtual we had a pretty good uptake with that. Um, but what we've just started doing is a bit of a hybrid of the two. So we might have half mm -hmm. that number of patients in the room with us, with the facilitator physically, obviously social distancing and allowing for, for space um, and ventilation. And then we would have sort of half the participants on the call as a virtual call as well. Um, and it, as Karina said, it does sort of demystify it a little bit. I mean, I know they still have to have somebody helping them access it in their own environment. Um, if you're going to go down that route, but it does take some of the, the scariness out of it. Mm, yes, yeah. I mean, I think I think blended is definitely the way forward because for a lot of our clients, the actual effort to get themselves out of their home, find the transport to bring them and to, you know, to be there, and they adore it when they're there, but but it can our, our sessions tend to be about two hours long some will be exercise and some will be social because they've really had to make a big effort to get there so an hour is not really long enough but if we could do a blended session um then at least people if they haven't been able to get out for whatever reason they could still join in to whichever bits they fancied really yeah and I think it leads back to that connectivity again isn't it because you know whichever way you want to do it to have the option of two is that inclusion whichever way then and, and as Trish was saying it's it's bridging that gap between the physical and the the digital um so yeah I I love that idea yeah I, I think so and and also just going back to um to actually your staff being blockers um it took quite a bit to get them to buy into that idea. And, um, and even so, as soon as we were able to go back to face to face, they were rushing back to do that. Um, we've still got a couple of online sessions going, but you know, just, just trying to get them to realize that actually it, it's a good way forward. It's an alternative. It's, expanding rather than contracting what you do and maybe you have to think a bit differently about how you're delivering things but it is possible 
And there's so many new technologies and platforms all the time that may be more suitable for people and easier for them to access. I know Caring Together at the moment are um, piloting a, um, um, a TV platform, I think it's called Sparko, um, where they're able to deliver sessions through the TV. And so if, if somebody can use a, is, you know, is comfortable using a TV remote, um, they can access online sessions, they can get information support just, you know, through their TV. And that's, so there's th these things coming along all the time, aren't they? Which is great. Yeah, and I, we've come across those as well, Karina, and I love that idea. But I did sort of on some research, then there's an additional cost. So if you've got somebody who's struggling with the, the connectivity costs and then that's an added on cost, then that's another consideration to that exclusion as well, isn't it? Absolutely. But at the moment, it is free for carers. So if anybody would like details on that, do get in touch. So Caring Together off, um, do have a pot of money to, to deliver that free for carers. And I think that if it's success, the pilot is successful, they're going to be looking at you know, options to, to continue it. So, yeah. Um, great. Just to mention, Sophie put in the chat about um, an app that people can use um, if, if they're struggling with their mental health. And I think Trish has answered that. But maybe would you share that with everyone, Trish? In case yeah, sorry, I, I garbled it very quickly earlier. And it's, not <laughs> an app, it, it's a full support service. So for people who are after the, the lower level mental health needs counselling type support, um, it's Quell. And I put the link to their website on there. So that is a, a real human being on the other end, but it's a chat service on text rather than a, a phone call or a face to face or a video call or something like that. Great. I'll pull out the links um, for the follow up email as well so you can all look at them after today. I, I would certainly give a kind of um, vote of confidence to some of the online apps. I mean, Quell, and uh, there's a number of other ones out there. There's sort of um, artificial intelligence coaches you can use, like um, Wobot, and there's another one that I forget the name of right now. Um, but there's, there's a bunch of uh, online apps out there. Um, and uh, working at uh, CRC previously with student support, um, a number of students use some of those apps for well-being, and I got some very unsolicited but very good feedback from a number of people that have used those sort of apps in terms of how they they found it help you know manage their well-being and actually keep in touch with how they're doing and you know take steps to improve it. So I think you know that there's definitely a benefit there for people who obviously you know as we've been talking about who are able to access them. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the question is, what, well, what can we do to help them access these things? Um, but, yeah, there's definitely benefit there if, if people can. And um, there aren't any more questions in the chat that I can see, but if anyone has anything, do you want to raise your hand um, so we can answer? I think we must have solved it. <laughs> <laughs> I did just put a comment in the chat about that, the idea of staff confidence in tech solutions as well. I think one of the things that we know we've seen through some of our clinical services within our broader um, mental health piece is that we've brought people in through some of the digital offers who with a face to face offer were the excluded group. And I think when we can help our colleagues see that actually it's not just about holding the people we had before, but we might now be able to reach people who were excluded for different reasons, that can really help boost confidence in, in staff wanting to learn the skills themselves, because we know how overwhelmed people are and it's scary as a professional to be asked to use a new way to reach out to people. But if we can help, help highlight what the benefits are, that actually you might be reaching a new client group as well as holding on to people that had, had previously been engaged. We've seen that as a really powerful bit of data that's come through. Um, I think we've got a question from Jay Dan as well. Hands up. Hi, I was just going to share um, what we're doing as a social landlord. So I just put my hand down. Um, I think we, we have the same troubles identifying people with digital barriers as everybody else and that one of our solutions quite often to try to overcome this is sending out surveys to find out who struggles with digital exclusion and that obviously never reaches anybody that doesn't have a smartphone or an email address. So as part of the digital um, week this week our whole organisation, we're a national organisation, um, so our, our, our whole organisation has got um, a whole host of volunteers offer to ask just two questions when they have a phone call with anybody. So that's regardless if you're an income officer and it's about an income call 
or um, somebody, a housing officer picking up something about a contractor arriving, um, us in our Empowering Futures Department, it doesn't really matter what area you, you are in, in in the organization. Um, we're asking the, the two questions and it's it's the key, you know, the key themes. Do you have access to equipment um, and do you have access to connectivity? And then the third question is, would you be happy to do a longer survey, which is um, 11 more questions around barriers? So we're hoping with that information, we'll have a bit more insight into the kind of range of problems that people have behind closed doors. Because at the moment, I mean, we've just been doing a consult. I say we locally, Cambridgeshire, have just been doing consultations. Um, inviting people I did, I did letters through the door inviting people to come and see us face to face very very small numbers come and do that and then the backup was a survey sent through to everybody with the opportunity to feedback as well but obviously like I said surveys do miss um, a lot of people so we're, we're trying hard at our end to identify those people behind closed doors um, that struggle that don't have the money or the skills or the confidence to access things and I think James if it's okay with you when we get some of those results in ever and I ever leading on this national role um we'll we'll maybe talk to you a little bit about what we have found locally and kind of put our heads together yeah absolutely <laughs> sounds really good I, I suppose the other thing that I was just thinking of as you were talking as well was um the just going back to what I was saying about fuel poverty and using proxies I think it's worth also that kind of idea of you know, you can have conversations around some of the alight, you know, some of the, the sort of neighbour topics, if you like, that actually leads you then to kind of go, well, uh, you know, how are you managing, you, you know, with your, your bills and whatever, you know, you managing with your internet connection, you know, yeah. can you afford your internet connection? If, if you pick up that, that they can't or that they don't, yeah. you know, then, then you've got the opportunity to perhaps gently explore that with people. It, it's yeah. difficult, isn't it, sometimes, because it can take a lot of resource to actually have the conversations with people but um you yeah, know we, we found that we had kind of away in lots of, lots of, lots of um ways. it was quite a biased process though so our resident support managers every time they would have a conversation with somebody that had been referred to, through to them it was part of the kind of protocol to kind of check all sorts of things you know do you have a car have you got food right now have you got fuel have you got digital connectivity you know a, a really holistic kind of assessment um, which is great because we are asking those questions straight away as soon as somebody's come through who's asked for help. But the key bit of information that that person's already been identified as needing help. So usually it's because they've missed, you know, they're in rent arrears, so they've been picked up by the income officer. So we already know that there's a financial problem just, just through that usually. Um, and, and so what we're not reaching is all of those people that are quietly just in the background, maybe struggling. So yes, it's great that we know that you might come to us because you've got no fuel or no food and we make sure that we talk about digital. We, we know we've got that ticked, brilliant. But there's a whole, there's going to be so many people behind closed doors, lots of our residents that could really benefit from this support that wouldn't even touch our radar needing support, which is one of the reasons we've done this, this campaign this week. Yeah. I think sometimes as well, that's that kind of maybe trying to have the conversation around rather than do you have a problem, would you like to improve, you know? It's like that, you know, are you, rather than asking, do you not have any qualifications? It's much better to say, you know, would you like to get a qualification? And, and it's the same sort of thing as, you know, would you like to actually save money on your, you know, your internet connection? Would you like to reduce your bills, you know, by saving money online? You know, sometimes it's maybe trying to present some of the questions in a positive way rather than in a negative way, you know? So rather than saying, you know, do you have a problem? It's like, would you actually like to improve things? And that, that enables you to have a better conversation with people where you actually be more aspirational, maybe in, in the way that you're, that you're discussing it with them. Yeah, I always remember Sue from one of the original digital partnership meetings, that I, I think it was Sue, Susan, so, anyway, um, saying it's, you know, conversations with people that aren't interested in tech are never about tech. It's always about, it's the focus should be on what tech enables because people aren't interested in, do you want a laptop? No, I don't want that. As Kelly said, it's the devil. You know, but if you go, oh, do you want to connect to your, your cousin that lives in this country? Or do you want to have a cheaper bill? You know, it's never about tech. Tech is scary. Tech is not what people want. But what tech enables, the benefits, I think that, that you know, strength-based conversations is definitely the way forward. Exactly. Exactly. I, I like it to cars. Most people aren't interested in tinkering under the under the bonnet. They just want something that gets them from A to B. And, you know, tech is, tech is that that thing isn't it really it's you know most people don't want to be fiddling around with it they just want something that gets them from a to b and we have to sort of work out where b is for them <laughs> um and then we can have that conversation about how they get there uh, tell me unconscious time is kind of getting we're, we're running 
yeah. close to time. Have we got a bit more time for any more questions? We've got about two minutes. So, um, oh, it's disappeared um, mm. or moved. Di Diane, do you want to quickly Hello, ask so, a question? <laughs> sorry, I suddenly thought I put my hand up and then uh, and then James, you immediately said there's not enough time, so I had to put it down again quickly. Um, hi, everybody. Nice to see lots of familiar faces. Um, I suppose the question I've got is, this is brilliant to have this kind of opportunity to chat about it. Where can those conversations happen on a regular basis? Because it feels like people are giving each other loads of really great tips and there's this kind of understanding about what might be available so we can kind of kind of integrate some of these offers a little bit more. And um, so I wanted to know whether that's something, is that something that Cambridgeshire Digital Partnership does or is there an opportunity uh, to kind of bring people together more often? I really think you should take that one, Sally. Yeah, it kind of segues <laughs> into my little closing statement, I suppose. So the Cambridge Digital Partnership, we've just set up as a kind of unincorporated um, group. So the kind of next steps are to kind of, well, get members to join us. So we've just launched a new website, which I've put in the chat, but I'll send an email. Um, on the website, we've got information about what our membership offer will include, which will be kind of quarterly network meetings for exactly that purpose, to bring people together and try and share those resources and skills and kind of all work together around these issues, um, as well as a kind of newsletter as well. Um, so I would really encourage all of you to have a look on there and sign up as a member, sign up for the newsletter. Um, we're looking to put our first networking event on in kind of early January when everyone's recovered from Christmas um, so that we can keep these conversations going, basically. Um, so do have a look. Um, you'll all have my email as well. So you can just email me directly with any questions. Um, but yeah, it's quite an exciting time. So do, do stay in touch, basically. And thank you very much for coming today. James, did you want to say anything? else about um only just uh, just a, another quick plug um if you weren't in at the beginning we've been nominated for an award um it would really help us if you spent 15 seconds just to to vote for us i've put a link in the chat um uh, or you can go to our website cambridgeonline.org.uk uh, and click on the link uh, at the top of there to vote for us uh, that will help us uh, get down hopefully to the final three for a national award um for what we've done during lockdown to help people get online be much appreciated if you could vote or share it with other people uh, as well to vote for us and help us get through to that final three. And on that point, you can use multiple emails. I tried. Oh, I voted thank you from so much, every Nelly. email I have access to. A check is in the post to you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it's been lovely to see you all. You know, on a personal note, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, obviously, if anybody's got any anything they want to follow up afterwards about anything they've heard today. You know, do get in touch with the partnership or, you know, with Cambridge Online, um, you know, and uh, happy to, to have more conversations going forward. And hopefully, you know, um, more organisations will tackle more digital exclusion for more people. And hopefully maybe see some of you at some of the other sessions uh, going on this week. Thanks so much for Kelly and Trish and Corinna for coming today and helping us and answering some questions for me. And um, hopefully see you all soon.